Hi, I'm Dr. Antonio Crucefo, and welcome to China Economic Research, coming to you from Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Today's episode, Academic Freedom in China. Press freedom in China is fourth from the bottom, a subject I covered in a previous video called Press Freedom in China. Academic freedom in China is similar. In December 2019, Reuters reported that one of China's top universities, Fudan, had altered its charter, dropping the phrase freedom of thought and adding a pledge to follow the Communist Party's leadership. Other amendments to the charter said that Fudan's party committee is the core of the university, suggesting that party control of the university would become even more stringent than it had always been. Fudan University ranked 109 globally in the Times Higher Education 2020 World University Rankings. But with academic freedom restricted even further, how could Beijing expect to maintain this ranking? Later in this report and other reports, I'll discuss how foreign countries, companies, and institutions kowtow to China, allowing China to skirt international norms, laws, and protocols, committing violations no other country would be allowed to, simply because of the potential economic loss of displeasing China. Will university ranking agencies continue to rank Fudan as one of the world's best universities in fear of cutting off the tap of Chinese students and the hundreds of millions of dollars they pay in tuition fees, which have now become the lifeblood of Western universities? Two other universities that made changes to their charters were Shanxi Normal University and Nanjing University. Others have since followed suit. These revised charters similarly included references to strengthening the leadership of the Communist Party at the universities. In a rare act of defiance, Chinese students and academics began discussing the changes on social media, but all of their posts were removed by the next day. Under China's censorship laws, one of the forbidden topics is censorship itself. To contextualize all of this, all universities in China have a Communist Party office. They also have a committee composed of professors, which is led by the party officer. The university is a work group or may be divided into communist work group units. Each unit will have regular meetings where they discuss communism, socialism, and the latest government policies. For the last several years, they've also had reading groups where they discuss the book Xi Jinping Thought and the benefits of his great strategies and programs such as the Belt and Road and Made in China 2025. I studied in China in a Chinese program where I was effectively the only foreigner. All PhD students were required to attend classes on political thought, proper political thought, and Marxism. These requirements were also written on my records and I was scheduled to attend the classes, but in the end I was able to get an exemption. But it wasn't easy because the system was computerized and my Chinese name was simply assigned to a group along with my Chinese classmates. The doctoral dissertations of my classmates and my students had to include sections on political thought and Marxism, even though that had nothing to do with their studies. Later, when I started my second PhD in economics, a similar situation occurred where in addition to normal economics classes, my classmates and I were scheduled to take classes in Marxist economics. And again, my advisor was able to get me an exemption, but all my classmates had to go. One morning, we we're sitting in a first period economics lecture and I was listening to my classmates giving answers. They were all brilliant quantitative economists who sheltered themselves in the world of mathematics because it required less knowledge of English but where they could prove their theories and hypotheses mathematically. Second period, I was off, but they had to go to Marxist economic class. But I just remember thinking that the lessons my classmates heard in that Marxist economics class must have been in direct conflict with what they learned in all their other classes and the research they would be conducting for their dissertations. Also, none of the concepts they learned in Marxist class would stand up to mathematical scrutiny. So how did they do it? And why did they do it? At both universities, my classmates showed me their Marxism notebook. They were just pages and pages of methodically copied text, word for word, which they would memorize and regurgitate on their exams. 
a little humorous anecdote here. In my second year of the economics program, we welcomed a new student who had a master's of economics and was teaching at a different university. In China, people usually do their whole education, bachelor's through PhD in one go. So the concept of a returning student, especially one with work experience, was new. Also, the students all wanted to know how, with only a master's degree, she could teach at a university. She explained, and our advisor confirmed, that there was a shortage of economics professors in China because they could all make incredible sums of money working for banks in Shanghai. My advisor told me this again later in a private meeting and followed it up with, yeah, except professor so-and-so, the banks don't want him because his degree is in Marxist economics. Because I was a graduate of a Chinese university program and was registered under my Chinese name, when I went to take over as director of a university, I was assigned to a work unit and theoretically had to attend the Xi Jinping thought meetings. I was told by one of the party officers that I was exempted from the meeting, but hilariously, one of my staff came to me and said it was her turn to present at the meeting, but she didn't know anything about the Belt and Road. And she knew that I had written a book about the subject. So she asked me if I would write the paper for her and she could present it. She later came back all smiles and told me the paper had been so well received that it had been published. So I guess that's a victory for either me or China, but I'm not sure which one. The fact that students and professors are obligated to take classes in Marxist economics, which they do not believe in, is a very concrete example of the control the Communist Party of China has over academia. On the campuses, they have a Communist Party Youth League, they have professors who are designated as the leaders of the eight minority political parties, but those parties must acknowledge the leading role of the Communist Party of China. And I can never figure out what their actual function was, apart from giving the appearance of China being a multi-party democracy, which no one buys anyway. Because if a party is not allowed to organize a change of government or cannot put forth a candidate for the leadership of the country, what good are they? And why would anyone join? But they are represented at the bigger universities. Under China's national defense education law, middle school students and undergraduates undergo military training just before the fall term starts each year, which is generally just before National Day. The training at most universities lasts one to two weeks and involves wearing a uniform, marching, and shouting communist slogans. At some universities, students actually learn to shoot. Since the amount of actual physical and military training is too minimal to have any practical defense application, it is generally understood that the purpose of the training is to reinforce patriotism. Since I always taught in foreign university programs in China, I often wondered if the purpose of the military training was to preempt the brainwashing that would occur from being exposed to foreign lecturers and foreign ideas.